Good morning. How is everybody today? Good? Good. I'm glad to hear it. Good, good. Hey, you know what? Let's pray this morning and let's worship. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for everybody that's here. God, I pray, at least for me, maybe there's someone else in here that needs it as well, that you would just lift the fog and uh, help me to see you more clearly. Help me to lean on you, to trust you, to know that everything's going to be okay and that you've got this. You've got me, you love me, and uh, I thank you for that. God, I pray that as we're here, this is the beginning of the week. Um, God, I pray that we can just be filled. And when we go tomorrow to our workplaces, to our school, uh, wherever it may be that we go, God, I pray that we bring you with us. Yes. And uh, you just be by our side. Help us to make the right calls, right decisions, and just be inspired by you and what it is that you have for us. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you want to stand. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. to thee just a closer walk with thee just a closer walk just a closer walk granted Jesus is my plea just a closer walk daily walking close to thee let it be world of toil and snares. If I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Just a closer walk. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Just a closer walk. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be. It's just a closer walk with thee. Just a closer walk. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Just a closer walk. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be. We have a little uh, announcement here for you about... So, you've packed your Operation Christmas Child shoebox full of love and prayer. Now, how to get it to the other side of the world where it can bless a child and become a life-changing gospel opportunity. That 
that starts when you send a $10 suggested donation through our website or through the mail. This ensures the greatest possible impact in the life of a child with a clear presentation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Your donation helps to cover shoebox collection, processing, and shipping. And it also provides each child with the greatest gift gospel booklet printed in their own language. This booklet encourages children and their families to receive God's greatest gift, His Son, Jesus Christ. Your $10 suggested donation also helps train and equip local churches on how to lead an outreach event, share the gospel, and invite boys and girls to participate in follow-up discipleship. Plus, when you give online using your Follow Your Box label, you can discover the destination of your shoebox gift. And last, but certainly not least, if you have packed all of your boxes using our nifty Build a Shoebox Online website, then your donation is included. The greatest impact, all for $10. To learn more, visit SamaritansPurse.org slash OCC. Grab your bulletins, if you would, this morning. I want to draw your attention to, the, to not only that, uh, we have a booth um, out in the foyer. You can see the, uh, the Operation Christmas Child booth. You can grab a box. You can get information uh, there. And uh, also next to them is uh, they're setting up the, um, the angel tree. The, our fellowship writers, our, our motorcycle ministry, um, uh, partners with um, prison fellowship uh, to help provide Christmas presents for the children of incarcerated individuals. And then we also open it up to nominations from the church. Any, any family that you might know that, that you, you know is going to have a, a struggle this Christmas season and, and you want to help them, uh, you can nominate that family anonymously. You can just put their name on, uh, on the sheet and then give us a contact number. We will contact them and, and put, those, uh, put those together. So we'll, we'll be receiving those nominations through the month of October and then uh, we'll have the angels out starting on in November. You can take an angel. You can you can go and provide a want or a need for one of these kids. Uh, bring it back. Uh, we'll wrap it, and then we deliver those in mid December. Um, we do that on the motorcycle, so we don't have to ring doorbells or anything. They all they hear us coming and they meet us out in the uh, out front. But um, but that's those, those are some great holiday ministries that are coming up because. Um, before you know it, it's going to be. It's going to be. Christmas is going to be upon us. Hey, here we are in October already. Um, I also, I want to gra grab your bulletins. There's, I want to say welcome. First of all, if you're a guest with us, we want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here, uh, worshiping with us. If you would do us one favor, you'll find uh, a connection card there in your bulletin. If you wouldn't mind grabbing that and filling that out with as much information as you can, um, you have two choices. You can either drop it in the offering plate as it goes by a little later in the service, or if it's your first time with us, you can hang on to that at the into service, take it to our kitchen. One of our kitchen workers will trade you and they'll give you a gift uh, just for being our guest this morning. Um, if you look inside your bulletin, there's a couple things to, to make mention of. Um, our trunk or treat is coming up on October 31st. That's going to be a Monday night this year. Um, it's a it's a great uh, a safe alternative to trick or treating. And uh, last year we don't I don't know how many people total came through, but I know that we gave away 500 Bibles um, through our, through our Gideon. So there was at least 500 of them. Um, but if you would like to help us with that, you can help in two ways. You can either sign up to be uh, part of it as um, you come and, and and reserve a spot. You bring your car. You open up your hatchback or your trunk, or and you decorate with whatever theme you choose. We do ask nothing scary. That kind of thing, but um, you can, and then you can hand out candy as, as, as the kids come by. Um, that's one way to do it. You can register through our website or through our church center app, or you can help by donating candy. Uh, we need both the, the bulk uh, bags of candy, the smaller candies uh, to hand out. Well, we also need full-size candy bars that we give away as uh, a prize to their scavenger hunt. Once they get, once they complete all their scavenger hunt, they come back and it just gives us one more, one more way to connect with them. So if you would like to donate either of those, you can drop those off in the boxes uh, here in our front foyer uh, for that. Also coming up, uh, all right, I wanted to give you a report on our swarm work day yesterday. We, uh, we had over 50 people show up to 
to, to work on the church, which was fantastic. Um, the, the, the rain showed up as well, so uh, we didn't get to do as much of the outside stuff as we wanted to. Uh, we were a little limited by the mud and, and that kind of thing, but we, we moved some people inside. We got a lot of things uh, done inside. We hung sheetrock. Uh, we hung insulation. Um, we uh, ran wires. For, I believe our electrician said that we, that we ran over 4,000 uh, uh, feet of wire uh, for uh, the upstairs and the downstairs and everything. Um, I know that we did, uh, um, we also did plumbing work and, and that kind of thing. So um, some walls were built. So it was, it was great seeing that many people. And I know that some of you didn't come because it rained. So the, the, we were hoping for about 100 people um, and 50 showed up. So the other 50, you guys, are gonna, you guys get another chance on the 15th. We'll let you guys do the, nobody, okay. <laughs> Everybody's kind of looking around like, uh, is he talking about you? He's not talking about me. <laughs> right? No, we have another work day coming up on, on October 15th. So if you'd like to, uh, as you can see, as, as, as all of us that were there can tell, it is so much easier with, you know, with more hands and with more help. So if you can help us on the 15th and, and continue some of that work, that would be great. Um, I believe that's it, yes. Uh, why don't you stand with me and, and, and cross an aisle, shake someone's hand, make them feel welcome, uh, tell them you're glad to see them this morning. Jesus is my friend. So him close to be here. Let it be, Lord, let it be. All right, if you want to make your way back to your seats, you may have a seat. Our, our deacons and our, our helpers are, have prepared the Lord's Supper this morning. Uh, we're going to partake in that. Um, I, I did want to, you know, when we talk about the Lord's Supper and, and we, we talk about remembering what Christ did, I thought, I thought, you know, it might be good for us to remember what we're supposed to be remembering, right? So I, I want to read, uh, I want to read out of Mark chapter 14. Um, this is uh, this is Mark's account of, of what happened on that Last Supper. In verse 12, it says, On the first day of unleavened, un, of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready, prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the 12. As they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me one who was eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the 12, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the son of man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. While they were eating, he took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is, my, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will never drink again. I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
we remember Christ's sacrifice. You know, I, I look at this story and I think there's no way the disciples could have understood exactly what Jesus was talking about. When he grabbed that bread and he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I don't believe they had any idea what Jesus was about to go through. I don't believe they, they understood what was about to happen to him. When he, when he passed the cup and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, I don't think they understood really what that meant. You know, why, why is he saying this is, this is his blood? They didn't have the benefit of hindsight. They didn't have the knowledge that we have today. We know, we can look back and we can say, ah, Jesus' body was broken. His blood was shed. Not for anything that he had done, but for the, to cover the sins of the world, to cover your sin and to, my, and to cover my sin. That's what, we, that's what we remember here today, that Jesus was willing, knowing what was about to befall him, he was willing to go to the cross anyway because of his great love for you and I. As we pass these around here in a moment, we're gonna, the, the deacons and helpers are gonna come and they're gonna give you a little piece of cracker and grab a little cup of juice. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I invite you to join us in this. You grab one of those, hang on to those. We'll take those together once everybody gets one. But I want you to not only remember the events of the, of the Last Supper, but remember the reason behind it. Jesus willingly gave up his life to pay for your sin and to pay for mine. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we're here this morning, as we remember the sacrifice that you paid for us, Lord, I pray that each one of us would, would do so in a worthy manner, Lord, that we would, that we would we would confess any sin that might be between us, any, any brokenness that might be between us. Lord, that we would, we would give that up to you today so that we could truly honor that sacrifice, not as a justification to keep on sinning, but Lord, as the, the, the mercy and grace that it is. And Lord, we, just, we thank you and we praise you. In your name I pray, amen.
took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. It says he then took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you. As often as you drink of it, remember me. Scripture tells us they then sang a hymn together. So let's stand and let's continue singing this song together. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. if you would, to Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10, we, we're continuing in, in our series through, through Joshua, through the story of Joshua, and it's a, it's a story of, of conquest, it's a story of, of judgment upon the people of, of the, the land of Canaan and, and, and the 
the gifting of the promised land to the nation of Israel. And, and we've seen God do incredible things. We, we saw the victory of, of Jericho. We saw the failure at Ai. Uh, we, we saw last week the, the deception of the Gibeonites. Uh, and we, we've seen the, the, the people of Israel, they, they, they have great victories and then they have great mistakes as well. Uh, today we're going to look at the we're going to look at the greatness of God. We're going to look at the the great conquest. We're going to we're going to see how how God continues to to move and, and to do things on the behalf of of his of his people and and to fight for them and and to do some incredible things. So we're going to we're going to look at Joshua chapter ten. I'm not going to read the entire chapter uh, today. We're we're, we're going to look at, we're going to cover most of it, but we're not going to read all of it. We're, we're going to focus really on the first kind of 15 verses. And, and uh, as is our custom, would you stand with me as we read God's word together? I know you're probably feeling like, boy, we're doing a lot of standing up, sit down, stand up, sit down. Uh, that's right. We'll get your cal- calisthenics in. Let, let's, let's do some arm raises with it too, and we'll, we'll get our exercise in for the day. No. Okay. How about, how about verse 10, or I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 1. Now it came about when, when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and had utterly destroyed it. Just as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king. And that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were within their land, that he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities. And because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. Therefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent word to Hoham, uh, king of, of Hebron, and to Piram, king of Jarmuth, and to Jephiah, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and the sons of Israel. So the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered together and went up, they with all of their armies, and camped by Gibeon and fought against it. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua uh, to the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all of the valiant warriors. The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them will stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal, and the Lord confounded them before Israel, and he slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and pursued them by the way of the ascent of of Beth Horon and struck them as far as as Azica and Makeda. We'll stop there. Would you, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as, as we read this story, as we, as we see this, uh, this, this conquest, this, uh, this thing that happened so long ago, Lord, uh, Lord, I pray that every one of us would see that you are still the same God, that you still, you still perform miracles, that you still fight on our behalf. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would, we would understand that and learn that this morning. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So here, looking at the, the greatness of God, I, first I want us to look at this great conquest, this great conquest. We see, you know, we, we saw that the God had given them instructions. He said, okay, I want you to go and I want you to, you're gonna take over the land of Canaan and you're gonna do that by driving out the people, by, by destroying the people that are there. Uh, by, by he was passing judgment on their idolatry and their and their decades and decades of of not following God and so and so we saw them march through they they took down uh, they took down Jericho then we saw them they failed at I until they cleaned up the sin in their camp then they then they destroyed I as well then we saw last week how the how the the the, the next group that was going to be taken over got together and said hey. Let's see if we can make a, a peace covenant with them. And they, they tricked them because the nation of Israel forgot to, forgot to consult God on that one. And, and they were deceived and they ended in, in, entered into this covenant. And so now they, they've got a, a peace covenant with Gibeon. And now the, the surrounding, the hill country folks, the, the other, the, they, now they're mad at Gibeon. They're saying, okay, not only do we have this, this group of foreign invaders that are coming in and destroying cities and, and we're gonna be next, but now we have this, 
the, the, the Gibeonites, the one that live in Gibeon, they, they made a pact with them. And, and so I'm sure they saw them as traitors. And they said, well, you know what? We need, to, we need to take them down before Joshua and the, the sons of Israel get even stronger. And so they unite together and they come and they attack Gibeon. Now here's Gibeon who had just, who had just bartered this, uh, this, this peace agreement, this, this covenant with the people, even though they did it through deceptive ways. Um, God said, well, we're still going to honor that covenant, right? And so when they cried out for help, uh, God told Joshua, he said, go ahead, do not fear them, uh, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them will, shall stand before you. Go ahead and defend your allies that you have now, um, despite the, the mistake that you made or whatever. We're going to be true to our words. So he, he sends Joshua to go and fight them. So we see that, that God rescues Gibeon. We also see that God defeated these five uh, these five armies, you know, it defeats them. It says here in, in verse 10, the Lord confounded them before Israel and he slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. He pursued them. We see that in spite of the mistake that Israel made, in spite of them getting deceived and tricked into this covenant, God was able to take that mistake and kind of turn it around. We can actually see that this actually turns into a good thing for the nation of Israel by the power of God, because what they were doing is they were going city by city. So one, one city at a time, they went to Jericho, they went to Ai, they were supposed to go to Gibeon next. They, then, now, then they're going to have to continue going city by city on this conquest. And God said, okay, you've made this mistake, so we're going to protect Gibeon, but what we're going to do is instead, we're going we're gonna to wipe out five of these cities' armies all at once. Right? The king of Jer Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the, the king of these, these five armies get together and God says, okay, even, even through your mistake, I can go ahead and, and my, my, my will can still be done. My plan can still come to fruition. And instead of you having to go one city at a time, we're going to bring five of them together and we're going to wipe out five of them all at once. Right? What, do, doesn't God make good use of our mistakes. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe he's so good at it because we give him lots of practice, right? We, we like to make mistakes but, and, 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 and mess things up and get ourselves into bad situations and, and troublesome spots. But isn't it, isn't it cool that God is powerful enough to work on our behalf, not just, not just in spite of the mistakes, but he can even use those mistakes to make a greater impact for us. You know, God can say, okay, you've done this thing, but I'm going to turn it into this thing. I'm going to turn it into something good. And so we see here, defeating these cities one at a time would have taken much longer. Instead, we're going we're gonna to see that they, they get to do it in larger groups now. And then we, we see in uh, the rest of chapter 10, we're not going to read, but, uh, but verses 16 through 28 talks about how God delivered the five kings. The five kings, they, they fled from their, from their armies and they took shelter in, the, in a cave and, and they, were, they were trying to survive this, uh, probably so that they could save their own skins, but also so they could go and, and regroup and try to put another army back together and that, and that kind of thing. And God delivered, uh, delivered the kings over to Joshua as well. And then we can see that God then delivered the five cities these cities that no longer had armies protecting them. Um, verses 29 through 43 talks about how Joshua went and took over those cities as well. So something that, uh, that would have taken five times as long was now being done, done in a much quicker fashion. The, the whole southern area of Palestine was, was given over to the people uh, through this mistake and through what God brought about through it. So we see this great conquest. But then we go on to see this, uh, a great miracle there's a great miracle that, that, that's performed here. And, and when we look at these, you're going to see that these are miracles that, that don't really have a, an equal or don't really have a, a counterpart. Oftentimes when you see miracles in, in Scripture, like in the New Testament, when you see uh, Jesus healing the blind or the lame, that kind of thing, you can see that same kind of miracle done again. The, the disciples did that or Paul does that. Or, or you know, when you think about the, the parting of the Red Sea, we saw something very similar to it here in the beginning of Joshua where he holds back the, uh, the, the, the Jordan River and that kind of thing. These two miracles are, are, are two miracles that you don't really see a counterpart anywhere else. Let's, let's pick it up in, in, in verse 11 here. So we hear that, that, that God has, he's confused the armies, he's given them the victory, and they, so they begin to flee. And in their fleeing, that's where we're gonna pick it up in verse 11. 
As they fled from before Israel, while they were at the descent of, of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with the sword. I want you to think about that for a moment. A hailstorm so powerful that it fell, not only, not only, let's think about this, not only did hailstones fall, it fell in a specific area where it killed the enemy and more people, more of the enemy died from the hailstorm than they did from the battle. Uh, yeah, oh, it's, it's climate change, yes, right? Th thanks, John Lemon. Uh, no, <laughs> this one isn't being recorded, I hope, uh, no. No, I mean, th I want you to think about that for a moment. Have you ever, have you ever seen a storm that, that, that was that bad? I mean, we had a thunderstorm yesterday, and it brought lots of rain, and it brought some flooding and that kind of thing. But have you ever seen hail that has just been that destructive? My family and I, when I, when I was in high school, we were living down in Texas. And when they say things are bigger in Texas, most of the time they're, they're telling the truth, right? Uh, well, we went through a hailstorm down there. Uh, all, my family, we were all at a, we were at a, we were at a Mexican restaurant and they had those uh, uh, terracotta um, uh, uh, roofing tiles, you know, the, the, the kind of stuff that flower pots are made out of, but they, that, was the, that was the roof on, the, on this place. And, and when the hailstorm came, it was shattering the, the, the tiles and they, they were breaking and then they were sliding off the roof and, and crashing down onto the parking lot, into the, onto the sidewalk. And so it sounded, I mean, between the hail hitting the roof and all the sliding and all the crashing, it sounded like somebody drove a freight train through the middle of this restaurant. And we were just like, man, this is incredible. And, and we, we waited for a break in the storm. We thought, man, we, 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 should, we should all get home. And so we went out to our cars and, and we were driving multiple vehicles because we were in a larger group and all of our windshields were smashed. Uh, they all had, you know, just all the cracks and everything everywhere. So we're driving home, kind of carefully looking through the cracks. And the hail came back so much so that we had to pull under an overpass and wait for nearly an hour because the hail was so strong and so bad, we were, we were afraid it was gonna cave our windshields in. So we waited for an hour, and then once it finally cleared, we went, we went the rest of the way home. When we got home and, and got to assess the damage, we stopped at a convenience store on our way there. We had to get some gas or, or that kind of thing, and, and we saw there was, a, there was a red Camaro that was just, just beaten to a pulp. And we went inside and we heard the story of the, the guy who, when the hailstorm hit, he, he pulled into the convenience store and was gonna, was gonna seek shelter inside. He opened up his driver's door and a hailstone hit him in the arm and shattered both bones in his arm. The hailstone was so large that it broke both of his, and so he pulled the door shut and he kind of hunkered down and he wrote it out. And they said, and they told us the story. We were like, we we're like, you gotta, you gotta be kidding me. He goes, oh yeah, you gotta go take a look at that car. So we went and looked at that Camaro. It was a brand new Camaro, not the new Bumblebee version, but the, you know, the, the look, this is back in the 90s, but it was a brand new cherry red Camaro. And you went out there and that thing was, the, the roof was half caved in. The hood had been beaten down to the point where it was wrapped around the motor. It looked like the motor was wrapped in red uh, aluminum foil. You could see the different components of the motor. You're like, wow, there's, there's the alternator, there's the this and that, because the hail had just beaten that hood and wrapped it around the motor. It had it stripped all the bark off all the trees. The, the hail came in from, from a side, and so half of the tree Whichever side was facing where the hail was, all the bark was stripped off. I mean, you, you, could, you could tell which direction it came from because the forest looked two-tone everywhere you looked. We, when we finally got home, we saw our, our house had been basically destroyed. It shattered every window on, the, on that side where the hail was coming in. I went into my bedroom and the hail had come through the window and had uh, struck my, I had one of those big queen-size water beds, you know, the big bladder thing. It popped my waterbed, so my room was flooded. I mean, it was, it was, our dog was hiding underneath a piece of furniture. We couldn't get him to come out for hours because he was like, you have no idea what I've been through. <laughs> and I was home alone <laughs> and all this. Guys, that's, that's the worst hailstorm I've ever seen. Our, our cars looked like someone had taken a baseball bat to them. We're talking dents this big on the hood. They totaled every vehicle we had. Insurance, they said it'd be easier to replace it than to try to fix every body panel on the thing. 
that pales in comparison to a hailstorm powerful enough to slaughter thousands. As I want you to understand, this is God working directly. This is God intervening directly on behalf of the, of the people. This is, this is God doing incredible things. You see, God's way is way more effective than man. As I said here, there were more people that, were, that died in the hailstorm than in the battle. Why? Because God's way is always more effective than our way, isn't it? God's way is all. Now, would this, is this something they would have thought of? Would they thought, oh, Lord, please send down. No, they probably never even seen or heard of a storm like that before. And yet God worked directly on their behalf. And God still does in our lives. We just don't, we, we, we just don't give him the credit for it. You see, God works directly on our, on our behalf, and we say things like, oh, well, wasn't that lucky? Unless, unless lucky is, your, is, is, a, is a, a nickname for God, quit saying that. <laughs> oh, what a, what a coincidence. Do you think it was a coincidence, or do you think it was God working directly and intervening on our behalf? You see, the same God that worked on their behalf still works on our behalf today. We need to understand that. God's ways are, are most often outside the realm of our capabilities anyway. So, okay, well, God, I, too often what we do is we go to God and we say, okay, God, here's the solution I've come up with. Here's what I think we should do. And now I just need you to bless it and make it happen. And then we, then we wonder why it doesn't happen. Maybe because God was saying, well, if you just would have asked me my way, or if you would have left it in my hands in the first place, I was gonna do something you never would have thought of. But instead, you're trying to get me to bless it your way. Sometimes we're like a little kid. I wanna do it, right? We went to, we went to a wedding uh, yesterday, and, and uh, Josh and Laura and uh, Tiny Man, uh, what they call little Tristan, uh, a cute little bugger, <laughs> and but he's getting to that independent toddler phase, and you know, so dad was dad was cutting up the chicken and trying to feed it to him. He kept going, no, 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 and then he's like, okay, fine. And then once once you let Tristan grab hold of it, he's like, I want to do it, right? Sometimes we feel like we have to be the ones that that do it. Wouldn't it be so much better if we just let God do it His way? He'd come up with ways that we couldn't think of anyway. So here we have this, this great miracle of this, of this hailstorm, God fighting on, on Israel's behalf. Then we see another miracle. Look in verse 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jashar, and the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day? There was no day like that before it or after it, when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua and all Israel with him returned to the camp at Gilgal. Guys, I want you to understand this. Here's Joshua. He's got this. He's got this task. Okay, I'm supposed to defeat this army, and I'm not gonna. We're not gonna be able to get the whole thing done. These are five armies that have come together. Sure, we we slaughtered some at the beginning. The hailstorm took out more than that, but there's still way too much work to be done. I don't have enough time in the day. Have you ever Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> have you ever felt like, boy, I could just use another six to ten hours of daylight, right? I could really get this done if I could just get a whole another day out of this. And so there's two miracles here. One, uh, the first miracle is the, is the miracle that Joshua was bold enough in his faith to pray for this in the first place. Why don't you think about that for a moment? It says that Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, prayed, Lord, please stop the sun where it is. It's not like he went to God first and said, okay, God, um, I was thinking about asking for like extra daylight, but that seems kind of like, kind of like a bold thing, but I don't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody. So can you tell me if that's good or not? We're good. Okay, cool. All right, here's what we, no. He went, he went in front of everybody and said, let, let, let's, Lord, please let the sun stand still. He had such incredible faith. And here's God. I think the second miracle is that God listened to him. It says here in, verse, in the second half of verse 13, 
I'm sorry, there, verse 14. There was no day like that before or after when the Lord listened to the voice of man. Even the author thinks it was a bigger deal that God listened to man than it was that God stopped the sun and the moon. Because stopping the sun and the moon is easy for God, but for some reason, God chose to involve man. Have you ever wondered why God chooses to involve us? Why does God choose to involve us? God may have had another way of, of getting this job done, but here's, jo here's Joshua with the boldness of his faith saying, okay, God, why don't you have this day last twice as long so we can get this job done? Here's God going, you know what? Because you asked with that kind of faith, sure, let's do that. <laughs> Let, let's, let's do that. That's, that's awesome. Good idea, right? I know I'm, I'm not saying that God was surprised by anything, but why does God choose to involve us? Because he wants us to understand that he will respond to the prayers of his people. That we have a part, we've been given a part to play in these stories. You see, God listened to man and God honored that request. See, we see the, this, this great miracle. So, the, so with this great conquest and this great, these great miracles, we need to understand there's some great implications here. Implication number one is that there is nothing impossible with God. Do you understand that? I've said that before. We talked about that when we, when we came up against Jericho and, and God gave him some really weird instructions, right? March around the city seven times, shout, blow the trumpets, we're gonna make the walls fall down. There's nothing impossible with God and yet we still act like it is. We still act like there are things that God simply can't help, can't help us with. You see, I believe, I believe Joshua's faith was a result of, of, of his experiences up to this point. God showing up when he, when he stopped the waters of the, of the Jordan River. God showing up at Jericho. God showing up at Ai after they, after they fixed their sin problem. God showing up in, in all of the different ways in this battle. I believe that emboldened Joshua to pray a bold prayer and to understand that there is nothing impossible with God. I think that it's the only way, the only way I can get inside the, the mind of Joshua and to think of something like that. You know, that, that would be like, that'd be like us out here going, okay, well, we didn't get, the, I didn't get my project done. Um, I didn't get the, the walls. Uh, I got the walls built for the elevator room, but I didn't get the roof on it. I just need some more time. God, can you just give me an extra four hours? <laughs> I, you wouldn't even think to ask something like that. And yet Joshua did. I think it was a I think it was built up over seeing God do the impossible. We need to understand that nothing is impossible with God. And yet we still act that way. I don't know how many times I've had people come to me and say, well, pastor, you know, my, 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 my marriage is, is destroyed. You know, there was infidelity. Uh, there was unfaithfulness. There was, uh, we made all kinds of mistakes. And so things were said and done that we just can't come back from. Uh, my marriage is over. I've had people come to me and say, my relationship with my, with my son or my daughter or my parents is destroyed. There's just no way that that'll never happen. It'll never happen. I remember I, I, I met a young lady one time. Her name was Ellen. Um, she was one of Brandon's friends when, when Brandon was younger, when, when I was Brandon's pastor. At a, we were at a church plant and Brandon was a senior in high school and he was he was working with the youth and that kind of thing. He was inviting a lot of his friends, his friend Ben and, and Steve and, and other people started coming to church and it started making a difference in their lives. And, and Ellen was one of their friends. And I remember Ellen came to youth group one night and she was there and she was there to, she wasn't there to see what was going on with Brandon. She was there to put a stop to whatever it was. She came very adversarially. And I remember during the lesson, you know, she was, she was kind of heckling me. She was shouting things out like, well, that's not really true. Or, you know, oh, you know, that's just a crutch. You know, religion is just, a, is just something for, for the weak. You know, or science disagrees and all this kind of stuff. Very adversarial. So, so I went and I talked with her after, after youth group was over. We, we sat down and we talked for about 45 minutes and she basically, she laid it on me all about how religion was false and it was unnecessary and how it was a great deception and I was, I was lying to her friends and all this other stuff. I remember I came home that day and I told my wife, I said, wow, I said, I, I, don't, I don't often meet people that I think are hopeless. I said, but I think I met somebody that, that there's no way God will ever reach this person. Fast forward two months later, 
God had continued to work in the lives of Brandon and his friends. She continued to see a difference in them. She, she started getting more and more curious. Finally, two months later, she was in my office. She was asking me, how, how can I be saved? And I didn't believe her. I thought she was there to mess with me or, or this was some setup for some kind of argument that she had put together or whatever. And so I kind of I kept pulling it back a little bit further. It's like, well... You know, you know in, order to, in order to do that, you'd have to believe in this and you'd have to place your faith and you'd have to walk away from some of the things that I know you told me you truly believe and, and that kind of thing. And she said, okay, I'm willing to do that. Well, you know, then you'd have to, I kept, kept making it harder and harder because I, I didn't believe it was real until finally she looked at me and she said, listen, if you're not gonna tell me how I can accept Jesus as my savior, then I'll go somewhere where I find somebody who will. I mean, this is the kind of young lady she was. And that kind of broke my heart a little bit. And I said, okay, if this is genuine, and to this day, she's in a godly marriage, living a godly life. This was someone that I was absolutely 100% convinced with her heart was so hard that it would be impossible for them to turn their life over to Christ. And yet God did the impossible in her. Does God wanna do the impossible with you? You may look at a relationship, a situation, there's, there's no way, there's no way that that'll never happen. I've got 15 years experience. I've seen this over 20 years. There's no way they're gonna suddenly change. That song, well, I've sung it twice already this morning, I think. Have we sung it? I can only imagine yet. No, it's coming up. Okay, we're preview for it. Sorry, third service woes. <laughs> We're about to sing, I Can Only Imagine. That was written by a guy who, was, who believed it impossible that God could ever reach his father. And yet God did. See, there's nothing impossible with God. Second thing I want you to understand, this great implication, God responds to the prayers of his people. God responds to the prayers of his people. God chooses to involve us. And we have an effect on what God wants to do in our lives. That's why we get together and we pray for people. That's why we, that's why we continue to, 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 to work on their behalf spiritually and say, okay, Lord, may this be done or, you know, or your will be done. Sometimes God chooses not to give us a blessing until we ask for it because he chooses to include us. About 18 years ago, uh, I went in for surgery. I've had, I've had both shoulders rebuilt. I've dislocated my shoulders 28 times between the two of them. Um, that's Texas football for you. Um, my, my right shoulder was so damaged, so destroyed. Um, I had a trainer tell me one time, or I had a doctor tell me, he said, he said, everything you've got has either torn, stretched out too far, or missing. I was even, I was, I had even begun to tear the muscle connections. I couldn't raise my arm any higher than this because my muscles were, all of those were beginning to tear apart. I had one guy tell me, he said, if you dislocate your shoulder again and your skin rips, your arm could fall off. <laughs> I was like, wow. And so I finally went in, my, my doctor, he tricked me a little bit. I went in to have something else looked at and he said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna have you, we're gonna take care of that right shoulder because it got to the point, if I was wearing tight jeans and I put my hands in my pocket, when I'd go to take my hand out of my pocket, I'd dislocate my shoulder, leave my arm stuck in my pocket. I'd have to have help getting it back out, put it back in, all this stuff. We were going in for surgery. Doctor said it's gonna be a four and a half hour repair. We're gonna have to go in and rebuild everything, cadaver tendons, put all this stuff back together. 40 minutes into the surgery, the doctor came out and talked, or no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. While we were in pre-op, my dad came in and he was, and he was you know, visiting with me and he came to pray with me and everything and, and he could tell I was, I was distraught. And he looked at me and he said, son, what's going on? He said, you've had surgeries before. He said, why are you so scared at this one? And I told him, I said, dad, I, for some reason, I just don't feel like I'm coming back from this one. And so my father prayed the boldest prayer of healing I've ever heard come out of his mouth. So bold, in fact, that I remember opening one of my eyes, looking at him like, really? 
do you pray like this for everybody you go? Because that, that sounds like a check that you can't cash. He prayed a bold prayer of healing. I went into this surgery. 40 minutes into it, the doctor comes out, meet, meets my, my wife and my, and my father in the, in the waiting room. And he says, I can't explain it. I don't know what has happened. We're even, we're gonna start an investigation and we're gonna figure out what's wrong with our MRI machines because we went in with scopes first to see where the damage was before we completely opened his shoulder up. And he said, and we were unable to find any damage in his shoulder. And he said, but we're having trouble with Keith in the recovery room. He's been in the recovery room for a little while now and he's not breathing on his own. It seems that he's had some kind of bad reaction to the anesthetic and the part of your brain that tells you to breathe on your own and that kind of thing, you don't have to consciously think about it. That part was being damaged. He said, if we had left, if we had kept him under for the full four and a half hour surgery, we likely would have lost him. Does God respond to the prayers of his people? Now, I can't stand here and say, if you, want to, if you want healing, go see Albert and he'll pray some fancy prayer and he'll heal. It doesn't work that way. I asked him, I said, why did you pray that prayer? And he said, I felt led to. I felt led to be bold in that moment and trust in God's ability to do the impossible. Guys, I want you to know, Nothing is impossible with God, and God responds to the prayer of his people. And when we're carrying out God's will, we can be bold in our requests. If we're doing something that God has called us to do, we can be bold in our requests. Wasn't Joshua bold? Lord, stop the sun and the moon. Freeze time long enough for us to get done what you've called us to do. And God said, sure, let's do that. Can't we be bold in our requests? What has God given us to do? He, we've been given some marching orders. No, it has nothing to do with conquest. We're not going out and driving people out of their cities and taking over. It's not the same situation, but we have been given the task of being the salt and the light in this valley. We've been given the task of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the city of Rifle, with with people that live in Parachute, Battlement Mesa, and Silt, and Newcastle, and Debec. And if they want to drive from Junction or Glenwood, bring it on. You know, come on, let's, let's do it, right? Because that's what we've been given. And so can't we be bold in our requests to complete God's will that he's given us? And yet we aren't. Why not? Have we, not, have we not been giving God enough credit for the things he's done and we haven't built up that faith muscle enough? Let's start giving God the credit. Let's, let's, quit, let's quit giving it to Lucky and whoever coincidence is. Let's give the glory to God instead. And let's start building that faith muscle so when it comes time, if God gives us some weird instructions, say, hey, I want you to go down and march around City Hall seven times and we're gonna change some things around the city. Sure, let's go do it. Let's have the faith to follow his instructions. Let's have the faith to pray bold prayers. Lord, let this happen. I, I wanna pray a prayer that the money that is given for this building be stretched the way that day was stretched, that it may pay for way more than we think it should. Why? Because God told us to build the building He's gonna give us the means by which to get it done. Let's have the faith and let's be bold in our prayers. Why? Because nothing is impossible with God and he responds to the prayers of his people. Let's pray big prayers. Let's make big asks and let's give God the glory for all of it. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we're, here this morning, Lord, I just pray that you would help each one of us to see that you are still the same God. The God that held back the waters of the sea, the God, the God that, that knocked down walls of cities, the God that had the moon and the sun hold still. You are still the same God. You still wanna work on our behalf, Lord may we exercise our faith and let's, pull, let's help us to, to pray some bold prayers. Lord, help us to see what you really wanna do. Lord, that you don't want us to just continue in the status quo and, and oh, let's just, get, let's just get closer as a small group and 
and oh, well, we're, it's gonna be all about, all about quality and, and not worry about the quantity. Lord, I know that you're a God of both. You're a God of quality and quantity. You're a God that wants to see a, see a revival in this nation. God, what if we started praying prayers like let us, let's change our valley? And what if we started praying prayers like let's change our state? Lord, what, what if there was a revival that, that the news media didn't know what to do with and they said, you know what, there's something that's going on in the state of Colorado and this western slope, this rural area, these, these small little towns and, and we don't know how it started but it's changing everything. It's changing the world. Why couldn't it start here? Why couldn't it be us? Let us grow our faith. Let us be bold in our requests. Lord, let's, let's see you do the impossible. Lord, I hesitate to even speculate what to ask for because Lord, I don't know what you've got. I, I, I do know this, whatever you've got is way greater than anything I could think of. So let's go with your plan. Let's do the incredible, let's do the impossible. Let's see you get the glory in the lives of our friends, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers. Let us start today. In your name I pray, amen. I'd ask you to stand and we're gonna sing a song of invitation. If God has spoken to your heart, if, God, if you've got questions or you need to ask, uh, you need for prayer, you come as we sing together.
great gift. Have a seat for a minute. We'll get, Pastor Keith's going to share an announcement with you. I've got one more thing to share with you, and I, and I save this for after the, the sermon because I needed the sermon to speak to the situation. Um, Kate Gibson, our, uh, she was our, um, our children's ministry director, has stepped down. Uh, she stepped down from that. She's got a um, a full-time job, four young children, just way too much on her plate uh, to continue serving in, in that capacity for us. I know, and so I, I wanted to announce that to you, and I, I hope that you'll join me in thanking her for her, her years of service. She's been doing it almost two years, and, and the, the, the impact she's had on our children and, and on our church has been great. We've seen it grow. I mean, they've had as many as 90 kids in the, in the children's ministry, and so... Um, so I, I want to, if you see her, her family, tell her thank you for her, her service and for doing a great job. But I also know that we, we need to continue moving forward with our children's ministry. Children's ministry is difficult. You need, it requires a lot of volunteers. It requires a lot of help. It requires, um, you know, being able to withstand, you know, the, the fluctuation. Some days, some Sundays we'll have 30. Sometimes we'll have 70, 80, 90. And so it's hard to prepare for and that kind of thing. It's a difficult ministry, but it is not impossible for God. God is going to help us. We're, we're talking about changing the way we do children's ministry a little bit. We're talking about looking for a replacement for, for Kate's position and what does that need to look like? What does that, what does that, that job become? Has, has God already brought us someone? Is God going to raise someone up from among us? Has, is God going to bring us someone from the outside? I don't know the answers to those questions, but I know that this is not an impossible ask for God. So would you join me in boldness? as we pray for our children's ministry. Guys, we, we will not continue to grow without a healthy children's ministry. If we don't have something for our children to come to and, and be challenged and to grow, our, our church will not continue to grow. Same thing with our youth ministry. Can you join me in bold prayer? Would you join me in, in a bold prayer right here, right now? Dear Lord, we come before you. Lord, we, we thank you for Kate and her family and the, the sacrifices that they have made to, to, to work in that, in, this, in that ministry for as long as they did. And, and Lord, we, Lord, we don't know what it needs to look like in the future. Lord, I know that it looks different than it did before and it, it's going to look different than it does now. And, and God, I don't have all the answers. Lord, I know that your way is going to be better than our way no matter what we come up with. So, so Lord, I just pray that you would that you would show up in a powerful way. Lord, that you would raise up leaders. You would raise up volunteers. You would raise up people that, whose hearts are broken for the souls of our young people, of our children, all from, from babies all the way through the youth, through, through retirement age. Lord, break our hearts for the, for the people that break your heart. Lord, we trust in your provision. We trust in your grace. We trust in your, your ways. Lord, I know there is nothing impossible with you. So we ask you to answer that prayer for us here today. In your name I pray, amen. Let's continue worshiping. We're gonna take up our offering now as we continue our worship.
down he will be with us he will walk with us he will never forsake us and some of that great stuff that we just think about of course it's going to be amazing when we get up there and we will never be able to understand what it's like until we're there but we can get a taste of it right here shame he's taken away my pain is healed in his name i believe i believe and i'll raise a banner because my lord has conquered the grave my redeemer lives my redeemer I know Cause I know He rescued my soul His blood Has covered my sin I believe I believe In my shame He's taken away And my pain Is healed in His name I believe I believe Missed. Uh, you lift. Here we go. You lift 
my burdens and I'll rise with you. I'm dancing on this mountain top to see your kingdom come. My Redeemer lives. 